Welcome, Melina. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Sophie, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, hello, everyone. So my, my name is Melina, and I would like today to share like a little bit of an experience that I have throughout my career in dealing with biodiversity, but also like I want this conversation to be more engaging. Um, so like you guys can use the chat box to ask questions or like to make comments and like I know like with all the zoom um in like digital world thing it's more difficult to have a conversation and and to be more interactive but if you want to like share your thoughts or or comments or questions um in the chat box I think that will be really really interesting because my talk today is about like it's more of a reflection okay and I would like to share with you a lot of like insights about the work um, that I did so far and like my career and like everything that we have been learning and we have been working together collectively at the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Okay, I will try to keep my chat box here. Okay, so that I can see while I am talking. So um, do you see my screen? I, I hope so. I hope everybody can. Yes, see we okay. do. Okay, that's lovely. So like, I would like you guys to start thinking a little bit about what you really need to live, like think about your life, like your lifestyle, um, your relationships, um, like your place in this world. And like, try to kind of imagine what are the many things that you think you need in this life. And then if you would like to chat, uh, to use the chat box to put it up for us, that would be great. I'll give you guys like a couple of like, like maybe one minute <laughs> for you guys to think and warm it up to this kind of conversation. So in terms of like what you need to dress up or like to eat or to sort of like exist um, or like what is, like emotionally what you're attached to like so all this kind of things like it doesn't need to be just material things but everything you think it's super important for you to live well right yeah so we have some 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 answers coming up like clean water relationships food water shelter clothing love pets yes that's great um so Oh, beauty, right. That's so very important. Like, and now, like, you guys mentioned some of the things that we are seeing on the screen, right? Like, like, so food, like clean water, like medicines, like, so a lot of you guys uh, mentioned, like, like very important aspects of like what goes behind, right? Our, uh, like our, the infrastructure of life. Right, so like the food. So how do we get the food? Is through pollination. So how do we get the air that we breathe or the clean water? Is through filtration systems, through ecosystems, and all this kind of things. But a lot of you guys also mentioned like culture, right? And like beauty and things that inspire us. And so like here you can see like some lovely fabric that like reflects culture of different people or how like nature is like inspiring people and they are representing gods or how their beauty inspire our art or our music, right? So all of that forms what we are calling like our life support system. And it's this like incredible network and webs over webs, right? So it's like, this overlaying of different relationships. Somebody mentioned relationships and like interdependent relationships in the majority of time. So we are all connected, all these species are connected in this web of life, right? That is literally like our life support system. So like when scientists says like that biodiversity is the web of life or like all our life is underpinned by biodiversity, that it's what it means. It means that all these elements and all these species, all these like living beings are connected, forming a deep web of relationships that 
provide everything that we need to live, right? And here, like, is the more scientific. I, I'm not sure what is your background of our audience today. So if you guys also would like to introduce yourself in the chat box and tell a little bit about, like, your background, what did you do, like, what is your interest here, I think that would be great. Also, so that I can keep an eye on it and, like, make sure that we are having a conversation that is most relevant for you guys. So this is a little bit the scientific way of looking to biodiversity, right? So here we have like um, our little, like very simplified web of life, right? And then what we cannot forget is that the current web of life, that this is all very dynamic, right? Um, I remember that sometimes at school, I would imagine that things kind of like exist this way and it's static and it sort of doesn't change. But the, the, the truth, the reality is that we live in the harmonious but very dynamic um, equilibrium, right? So all these species are like sort of like sharing the space like with each other and in harmonious and non harmonious ways. So like you have competition and you have predation and all this kind of like biological aspects um, and it's very dynamic. So it means also that the current biodiversity that we have is a reflection of the whole history, right? So the diversity is not only connected to who is here at the moment, but who has been here and who is gonna be here in the coming years and thousands of years. Right, so we can never forget this dimension of time when talking about biodiversity and the life on Earth. Um, yeah, so I see everybody here, sort of like a lot of people are from like the biological side of natural um, sciences. Um, and then like, I would like to also mention that biodiversity doesn't only mean the species, right? Or the genes or like the ecosystems, like the scientists, like natural scientists like to, like are used to talk about it, right? A very, very important aspect of biodiversity and what biodiversity provides to us is the cultural aspect, right? Let's not forget that like all the culture that we have, that we produce, that we are attached to, that we depend on, also is intrinsically related to nature, right? The languages, the dances, the music, right? And this part, it's not so sort of like um, showcased as part of biodiversity because unfortunately our society, like our modern society is still very much siloed, right? And natural sciences don't really mix so well with social sciences or humanities. And then like, we try to box everything in our society, right? We think that this makes it easy to organize and to understand it better. Well, it does in many ways, but it also it starts to keep ourselves a little bit more narrow-minded. And then we might be missing the connections in between it, right? So like the conclusion, like that, what I'm trying to discuss here is that while nature provides a bounty of essential goods, so everything that you guys mentioned, it also has like many more like dimensions to it, like which is all this rich social, cultural, spiritual, and religious significance. And that is being set by the Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is like a UN body that tries to bring like um, a diverse group of scientists to collect all the science, like the knowledge, the best knowledge available on biodiversity and ecosystem services to present to society in kind of like summary of like assessments and like what is going on with the biodiversity today, right? Another important aspect that I would like to mention to you guys is like, the location of it, right? So where is all this life? Where is all this biodiversity? And as a lot of you guys are from the natural sciences, like you might know that biodiversity is richer. So there are more species, more complex ecosystems in the tropics, right? And compared to like the other regions. And like there are many scientific reasons for that, 
like you you might have studied already so i'm not going to focus on that i'm going to focus on the relationship of these places with the local and indigenous communities that used to live there or are still living there so like um there was this idea i don't know in which period you guys study it like biology um or study that at high school but before like there was a misconception that like indigenous people would destroy um, their environment, right? And the local people were the ones responsible for the destruction of nature and the environment. And then like, that was kind of like a lot of like the conservation of biodiversity, biology conservation science was about keeping people outside of nature, right? And now, like finally, I think Western science is starting to recognize, right? that that is not the case that actually it, in many senses is sort of the opposite if you have like the original community living in their original territories like what is going on is that this community which has a very deep and intrinsic relationship with those territories so like their livelihoods their culture their spirituality is completely connected to that and they also have accumulated the knowledge to manage it in the best way possible for their priorities, right? So most likely that the biodiversity is gonna be richer in those territories. And that has actually been proved by science recently. So they have found out that about like 70%, I think of the world's biodiversity is found within the territories of indigenous peoples and local communities so like and it's really interesting how those landscapes are because i had the opportunity of working in japan working and studying in japan and there they have this concept of landscape-based approaches for conservation and they have traditional landscapes and so like it's it's proven that the traditional landscapes that have human communities living together with nature is richer in terms of biodiversity and bicultural diversity than the landscapes they are abandoned and there's no people living there anymore so like obviously it's different when it's not a community that like used to live in the area right so for instance we also have cases in bolivia of people from the andes region like indigenous communities from the andes region that have been like forcibly relocated to the Amazon. And then obviously they don't have the associated knowledge or the traditions of that area. So they don't know how to manage it, right? So there are like this dimension and like there is this new term of like territories of life that tries to be more like um, holistic in terms of understanding this relationship between like humans and nature, right? Like which, it's very interesting, like, I don't know what, what, how you guys see it, but I see Sarah saying that we are nature, definitely. So basically for a lot of these people that feel connected to the community, they are part of this biological community, this like natural community, and they don't see themselves separated, right? And I think that might be one of the biggest things that we need to do back again to kind of like reconciliate, right? with our community, with ourselves, like with nature. So like lots of things for us to think about. And however, like that's where we enter, I suppose, uh, was modern, Western, especially societies like, um, hello, Anthropocene. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of this thing, um, but like scientists are calling this new geological period as the Anthropocene, because it's this period where humans have emerged as a force that can change like so drastically the planet that we are living on that like it can change geological history, right? And as you can see, it's just a bunch of graphics like that is showing like social statistics or like commercial statistics, like uh, primary energy use or fertilizer consumption, paper production in the light orange, and like statistics from like not like natural sciences and like what has happened with our resources, 
So for instance, carbon dioxide emissions, shrink agriculture, for instance, tropical forest loss. And we can see that it all increases exponentially, like sometime like it started uh, like after the 1900s and then like most likely after the Second World War, right? And this is what we've been doing, right? This is us. And this is like why we are doing this, why there is a kind of like drastic increase in all of this production, extraction, consumption, like because we need more and more and more and more, right? So more food, energy and materials than ever before are now being supplied to people across distant regions. So like our system of like production, which means like maximize production, maximize like profit, like started to sort of like increase, right? It's like enterprise to sort of like feed like the growing population, but not that, like not just that, but especially like the lifestyle of this population, right? Um, however, like all this consumption and exploitation and like production is also happening in a very unequal way, right? Unfortunately, we are still living in a very unequal society. And like, although, and, and this can be an uncomfortable conversation, right, to have, because we don't want to feel the responsibility or we, we don't, don't want to see ourselves as part of this problem in a way, right? Because we don't want the world to be this most likely, right? But it's kind of like we don't really have a choice. We don't really have a way of changing because it's the system, right? Like, um, but that doesn't like, um, that should not prevent us from talking about that. And I think, especially when it comes to biodiversity, like in nature, this is a conversation that needs to happen because at the kind of core of what is happening in the world is this inequality, right? So what is actually happening? So as we can see, this inequality is everywhere. So like, um, this is kind of like a very outdated map of the ecological footprint, but then we can see the red um, zones are the most sort of like um, heavy, like consumers, right, of like the resources and they have the highest footprint. And then the green areas are the ones that don't have a high footprint. But if you look at it, the biodiversity of those resources are all allocated in the yellow and the green zones, right? So basically what is happening is that all of this wealth from nature is being extracted, but then it's being distributed very like unequally, right? And then what is happening really? Like we have this level of disparity and this level of inequality. We are living in a world where we have like this super rich people, right? Um, that consumes and that their enterprises are probably exploiting much of these resources, right? What, while a lot of the people don't see any of it and only gets the burden of this exploitation. And I think this is really important to talk in the context of nature because in the end, all the biodiversity, all the nature is being threatened by the exploitation of the resources to become profit somewhere, right? And to feed this market and this kind of like system. So like, what is at stake now when we see this level of exploitation in this level of inequality at this global scale, right? I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the planetary boundaries, but a group of scientists have sort of like un decided to kind of like understand the world in terms of like, there are a couple of like um, absolute limits of this planet that we cannot extrapolate because otherwise the planet stop functioning properly and then we might be going in a very like disastrous like pathway right and then biodiversity so the biosphere integrity which is functional diversity and genetic diversity as you can see it's all already going beyond like the safe operating space which is around here right 
So like, and then we have like climate change, also and land system change and like the biochemical flows, which is pollution, like basically, right? Um, so this is what is happening in the world, right? And then like now, in, so with all these boundaries of the planet at the limit, what is happening with the living beings that are living the planet, right? So this is from the WWF Living Planet Index report, okay, from 2020. And like they observed that like the average abundance of population have declined by almost 70%, right? So that is the impact of all this human enterprise like inequality in the world this is also from the ebas global assessment report like and then they found out that one million species are on the brink of extinction right so you can see like the risk of extinction that is skyrocketing for all those groups like of species and then what does really mean to all those like um, goods and like um, sort of treasures that we receive from nature, right? And then IPES, like, which is this platform, like the intergovernmental panel, they like started to understand nature's contribution to people. So everything that comes to nature and then they classified in different categories. And then if you can see here, like you have like the materials and then the regulation. So like the kind of the services and, and, and like the option maintenance. Um, and then you see here the non-material like uh, contributions as well. And if you observe the graph, so all of the arrows are pointing down. So we are losing, right? All those like contributions here, except of this three, which is energy, food and feed and materials and assistance. So what is one of like the kind of like assumptions you can take from this graph is that basically we are trading everything else, right? So we are trading all these contributions just for this tree, right? So we are transforming all of that in energy, food and feed and materials and assistance. So basically we are transforming everything that makes life in this planet possible into things. That's what we are doing. And what does this look like in our planet, right? So this is the country where I come from, the Amazon, like this is the Great Barrier Reef, like this is also like all the fires. I think you guys have experienced it like here in the US, but also elsewhere in the world, right? Like the climate change impact, this is a mining enterprise in South Africa, I think. Um, and this is like the COVID pandemic like impacts, right? So this is what it looks like for our planet in images. Also, this is what it looks like for people like us, you know, like they're living on the edge of where this exploitation is happening. So like we are having year after year record number of environmental activists or environmental human rights defenders killed every year because they are the ones living in those territories they are being exploited or at the edge at the frontier of being exploited and they are just trying to defend it and because we have a lot of like countries such as mine with very weak governance and with huge like pressure from markets abroad right like from financial interests abroad like to have those lands exploited. And so we have a very, very bloody and violent conflict happening on site. And nowadays it's impossible to talk about nature conservation without understanding those conflicts on the ground and without trying to kind of like connect all this social, cultural, human, like political, social, economic aspects with the biological aspects as well, right? Um, there are a lot of good resources on it. And like there are like there is even like a global map of like environmental conflict and like the amount of people that have been kind of like impacted by that. So it's all it started to sort of like boil down like into the inequity and inequality of the system. And like 
So what we are seeing today is not like a climate crisis, right? Or a biological crisis or a nature crisis or like a social crisis or like just a war. Like we are living in layers of like crisis. They're all interconnected forming a social like ecological crisis you can call it any anything but it's important to understand this multi-dimensional nature of those crises and then like try to think and ask ourselves ask yourself where is all the root of this right like why like how all these crises are interconnected we know like how climate biodiversity covid for instance like human rights violations are connected Right, like now let's try to understand and dig deeper so that we can sort of like perhaps do something about it, right? And then like when you go really, really, really down to the root causes, and this for instance is out of the IBES Global Assessment Report, which I really like recommend you guys to, to take a look at it, not at the full report, because it's like over a thousand pages. Like it's really interesting, but like, you know, it's very heavy reading, but they have a summary for policymakers that could be interesting for you guys. But so they found out, so remember before, I think like some 10 years ago when we were all sort of like, studying biodiversity, they would only talk about this direct drivers, right? Like they would say like, oh, what is causing biodiversity loss? Oh, it's agriculture, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species and land use change, right? Um, what do we know now, right? We know that these are not really the real causes of biodiversity loss, right? I mean, obviously they are causing it, but what is causing that, right? What, what is driving that? And those are the indirect drivers, right? Now, indirect drivers are interesting things because like issues such as like demographic, so like growth of population or like cultural, like, you know, like, um, being like eating sort of like meat every day, like in huge quantities or like drinking milk or eating a lot of processed food, right? Like that's pretty cultural um, or like technological, right? Like all oh, like the, the sort of like production of like development of like internet and like all this kind of thing. So these are not necessarily right or wrong, right? They are not necessarily good and bad these are issues so like how do we decide if something is going to be good or bad right so these are driven by values and behaviors right so if our value is profit first like it this is our priority this is our principle so how do you think our societies, our economies, our technology, our institutions, our policies are gonna behave, right? What kind of policies are we gonna design? What kind of institutions we're gonna have? What kind of like technology are we gonna produce if our value is profit first, for instance? Are we gonna develop good technology for the majority of the people? most likely not right we are going to have the kind of technology that we have today which is like they have that program like oh now everything is going to not work properly anymore and everything is going to be kind of like not very good quality so that it breaks faster so that we buy a new one because we need to buy more because that's the only way to fit the system that is like completely unsustainable right so the idea is that it's not that technology is bad bad right like, but the way the values that we are prioritizing, the behavior that we are having causes, like influences all the sectors of our society to be unsustainable, to drive biodiversity loss, to be unequal, right? So the problems really are in the values, right? That we as a society are prioritizing over others, right? And like who, who has a say on the values of society, right? Who drives culture? Who drives that? So I think this is a little bit of the reflection and of like the conversations that a lot of the people, a lot of us really needs to start thinking and start to kind of like engage so that we can really change the rest, right? Like because otherwise, if we're just operating in this area here, 
we are not really fixing anything. We are not really improving anything, right? If we don't change things here, like there's not gonna have a very big impact. So this is sort of like what we are gonna talk a bit more from now on. So keep this image here, right? And here I'm putting some of the values that we see very blatantly in our society, like the profit first, like the inequality. So like the, the, the idea that like it's good for some people to be super rich and like the, the idea that like this is fine, you know, like, or like to have more and more and to consume more and to just waste things, right? So this is the situation that we are, right? So like what, what, what comes from now? So how do we sort of start figuring this out? And let's kind of like do like nature, like let's take a deep breath. I think we need, right? Because the system make us so like frenetic, so fast is all about more and more and more and more. And I think like for a lot of us that are working with biodiversity and working with nature, like we observe nature and it's not about more and more and more and more, right? Nature have like, you can see different priorities being optimized, like being sort of like, um, like um, reflected um, than just one thing, right? Now, I think the path that we are all like striving for or that we are kind of like getting into the conclusion that we need is that we really need true transformation, right? Like the system, like, so we are understanding that the system is faulty, right? The system is operating under like very um, self-destroying priorities. So like, if we are living in a closed system, um, like that resources are finite. So how can we be living in like an economic social cultural system that goes on like infinite production right and infinite consumption and infinite waste i mean that really is incompatible so like what we need is like so the true transformation of the system right so that's what the kind of like the scientists now are talking about is like the transformative change and like there is this quote from einstein which is like Obviously, like we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So how we get out of this box, right? How we can pursue a change, a transformation towards sustainability that is profound, systemic, is strategic and reflexive. And this is what like the IPES Global Assessment wants us to think about. And that's what they started to do a study about that. So all the scientists starts to like compile the science and the knowledge that exists in this area to try to help us understand which are the pathways forward, right? And so they started to, to kind of like, based on this evidence, they say, successful change will not happen easily or spontaneously, right? Like nobody like wants to get out of the comfort zone. This is not like the status quo. So like, how do we kind of like push, right? It will require broad and intense effort, and it will require understanding of how these local and global systems are connected and working in, together in this dynamic. So what is this dynamic between local and global so that we can understand, so that we can do the proper interventions in the system that is going to generate more transformation and more impact, right? Another thing that re they reminded us is that like we need to challenge ourselves and establishment. Change doesn't come easily, right? We will face resistance. There is a huge imbalance of forces in uh, power forces, right? There is, we live in a world that has a lot of power struggles, right? And the system, so like it makes us think that the system is in a certain way because there are a certain group of interests that are being taken care of, right? They are being sort of like rewarded. So we need to think about those power dynamics. Like, otherwise we are not gonna be able to see pathways for change, 
right? And we might be focused on activities or in things that are only perpetuating the same system of oppression and exploitation without us knowing, right? So like this takes us to like the kind of like I, I, I know people don't like to hear that sometimes, but like there is no quick fixes, right? I think like everybody that is trying to think in terms of environment, in terms of like changing the system, we need to understand that there's not a real solution, right? Like what we will have to do is that we will have to collectively like strengthen like democracy, I mean, strengthen the collective power of people of like, societies, you know, like to understand better the life that we're living to kind of strive for common well being, right. Mm -hmm. And then through that we are going to start moving towards a pathway of change. So because the crisis and the world that we're living is too complex, right. And so it's impossible, you know, that there is like a guy, you know, that is going to say, oh, yay, I am this freaking amazing scientist and I'm going to create this amazing machine that is going to fix our problem, right? But there is a lot of people saying those things. And just for you guys to have an idea, like, um, like a couple of years ago, I was in one of this UN negotiations, like, um, talking about biodiversity. So there was a negotiation about biodiversity. And there are things like um, called climate geoengineering or like all sorts of different weird technologies with weird acronyms, okay? But literally one of the solutions that those scientists were proposing was to spray the clouds and paint them white, okay? To sort of like, spray things in like in, in the sky to paint them white or to release like foam into the ocean, white foam, so that it imitates the ice and reflects the, the sunlight, right? So that we prevent climate change. Um, so there are these kind of things that honestly, like you can find on a James Bond movie, right? Like, but there are people doing it. There are people paying and investing on these kind of technologies, right? So like that's the kind of thinking that we need to prevent, right? These are not really going to solve anything. These are only going to create more problems because these are attempts to make us not look into the real root causes and try to distract us you know, like into thinking that there's going to be a magic solution and not really do the change that needs to happen, right? So this is kind of like really like the situation that we are here. And if some of you aren't like following the negotiations or the policy, politics involve climate change is basically about that is basically about like finding tricks and ways into the political system so that we don't need to stop emissions right so that we can create carbon markets so that we can create like offsets of carbon and all this kind of tricks you know that like doesn't really work because you're not working on the real like cause of the problems right so like Let's never forget this and let's never forget that institutions, politics, economy, technology, people are not like bad or good, like in that sense. It, it's the values, it's the principles that are moving the actions and moving the policies and moving the institutions that will like dictate which pathway we're going to go, like self-destruction, right? Like or harmony with nature or balance. Um, and most likely we're not going to go to either of the extreme. Most likely it's going to be somewhere in the middle. But like the more people are aware of this, the more we can push our actions towards more like balance, right? And more transformation. So like this group of scientists, so like IPES also, like through their research, they compiled some of the leverage points um, that we can use and that we can be aware of to really have a much bigger impact because we know that transformation is not an easy thing to happen. It's not a fast thing. It's not going to happen fast, right? But we can start using those leverage points to start kind of like trickle it down, okay? So one of that, and then like you're going to like, I'm going to go through it, but you guys are going to be surprised how obvious 
and how simple they are you know like and how it's the complete opposite of like what some scientists are pushing for in terms of technology or some politicians are pushing for in terms of like solutions right like um or business people sometimes like so they say like that the world is diverse and there is diverse cultures and diverse visions of good life that have uh, like different priorities from this profit maximization of profit like society you know and then based on their different visions of what good life means they are gonna develop policies technologies like knowledge um social structures um like economic structures that like foster a different vision of good life so if your good life is like not like be a millionaire you know that lives in the jet like in a huge house like that travels along with a private jet that wants to have all the luxury in the world you know um and that is what like living good means to you right so what kind of like world you're gonna build if this is what a good life means but there are other communities other people that have a very different vision of what a good life means and perhaps we are gonna find answers with those communities with those people right so like there are a lot of communities in the world that have this vision of good life that is associated with a significant lower impact on natural resources right and we are not saying that everybody needs to be living like that but that there might be good like practices that we can incorporate in our system right also like another of the big sort of obvious things but is the big elephant in the room that like they found out is that we need to reduce inequalities because inequality is generating this over exploitation of the system and like a very like unequal power balance leading to power struggles right so like we need to start asking ourselves like with the way or with the practices that are in place or with the policies who gains who is losing who has the access and the rights to the benefits who gets the onus and the disadvantage and the negative impacts? Why these inequalities are being perpetuated over time? So what, why we cannot fight the inequalities and they just get bigger and bigger, right? And never forget that inequality is gonna exacerbate biodiversity loss. And then biodiversity loss is gonna exacerbate inequality, right? So it's all like a vicious circle that we are living and it's connected. Another a very, very, very important like factor that they found out is the issue of justice and inclusion in conservation, right? Like, so for instance, um, and this is a very kind of like polemic issue and, and not, not polemic, but it's kind of like a hurtful issue to discuss and that we need to really talk about that and to understand what really happened because like a lot of the conservation that has been done in the past and actually the beginning of the so-called conservation movement was like basically another way of like evicting like like local communities and indigenous communities from their lands so that governments or companies are like you know um other interests could take those territories and could take control of the resources associated to those territories right so like a lot of for instance the creation of the national parks in many of the countries are like basically rooted on like um genocide or killing people or displacing people oppressing people and that like most of the communities are still living with the impacts of those policies at the beginning of the century, for instance. So if we as environmentalists, as conservationists, as biologists, as, as people, right, don't really like um, think about that, and it's not about blaming people, right? It's not about like 
uh, pointing fingers so much, but it's about recognizing that what happened was wrong and it, it should not happen anymore and that we should change the way conservation and the way like um, protection of nature has is happening, right? And like to make sure that we do it differently. So the issue of human rights is really, really important because like whenever there is biodiversity loss, you are gonna see associated violation of human rights, right? And whenever you see like violation of human rights in like, like areas of high biodiversity, you're gonna see loss of biodiversity as well. So, and this dimension is something that sometimes like people don't understand, especially scientists, because like we still learn like some of these policies like of creation of national parks as the sort of the biggest solution, you know, without really understanding the other dimensions and the other implications. So like if the conservation that we do is not based on human rights, like the protection and fulfillment of human rights, then like we are just doing more of the same, right? Um, and we need to be very careful about the difference between like rights holders and like stakeholders, right? Like the people that have rights over that, that their lives are fully depending on that or people that just have an interest over that because that will like showcase like the difference in the power like relations, right? Um, and how to sort of like solve conflicts or how to deal with conflicts when it comes to resources. Um, another factor that it is a leverage, like that we need to understand it better, like and to in order to find pathways for transformation in this like layers of crisis that we are living is the issue of telecouplings and like in interconnections and externalities. So basically we are living in a globalized system where like things that are produced in Argentina, the goals to the EU will have like all sorts of different impacts in China or elsewhere, right? Like, so I think like now we are very aware of that, like that this happens and this exists, but we are not aware of like the details of all of that and where is re the real impact happening, right? Because the number of suppliers, the number of like people and businesses and like systems involved in that is so huge and there's no disclosure about it. So it's very difficult for us to understand, to study and to prevent some like negative impacts that might be happening, right? Um, so this is a huge leverage point. So like there is a lot of like research going on in these areas and I have seen masters um, and PhD studies just on telecouplings and these externalities. The other like leverage point that has been stated is the most obvious thing, but it's the issue of education, like an education that is transformative because it is a matter of values in the end, right? Like the values that we are prioritizing as a society is driving the kind of like um, system, the kind of oppression, the kind of exploitation that is generating the loss of biodiversity, the, the climate change, and, and consequently like the degradation of our life support system and our future options, right? So how do we change values? How do we educate about values? How do we inspire values? They're more collective. They're more like um, about like the collective well-being rather than like an individual well-being or that like values that are compatible with a finite system, with a finite planet, right? So one of the ways is through education. So Education is a leverage point, is a huge leverage point for transformative change because it will address many of these indirect drivers and it will let lead to behavior change, right? It can like help people to reconnect with their communities, with nature, with themselves, right? And then start to change their values and their priorities. However, education is always the least important priority when it comes to policy, especially associated to environment, right? Um, so we can start to change that. This is something that like society has more access to, right? But 
like does it help if it's like an education that it doesn't talk about rights it doesn't talk about values you know like it, it it's kind of like flat and superficial will that pr promote this change no right so the transformation so the education like system like the education infrastructure the institutions also need to change in order to promote and develop educational practices they are truly transformative right and then here i just kept like put a quote of like a brazilian educator he's very well known and, and respected everywhere like that he did a brilliant like a study about like an education that like it's really liberating he calls so he says like when education is not liberating the dream of the oppressed is to become the oppressor so like you see so like if we do education that is not reflexive that it doesn't promote this discussion this like exploration like of different visions different values like you know what kind of education we're doing and what kind of like um, values we are promoting right so i think this is the the biggest kind of key i think um to to our collective actions as society towards this 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 challenge that we are having and the other issue here is about technology right like as i mentioned at the beginning like technology is just a tool it can be good or bad, depending on what kind of values we're following for this technology. And this is extremely important for all of us to, to have an eye on, why? Because technology is fast developing in this world without the consultation of people, right? So very few people are deciding what kind of technology we are creating and what kind for whom. Right. So those questions about like the inequality. So who is benefiting from this technology? Who is having negative impact? Like who has access to this technology? Right. And these are very important questions because that is going to tell whether this technology is going to lead us to a sustainable and just pathway or if it's just going to generate more oppression and more inequality and more damage to the environment right so like we need to make sure that the companies and the governments ensure that the, the technology takes into account precautionary principles rights-based approaches right in order to prevent this negative or ambivalent outcomes of technology. And one big example of that is, for instance, like geoengineering, oh, oh sorry, genetic, like um, genetic engineering, you know, which is manipulating the genes and like um, in order to create like genetically modified uh, species and all this kind of things, you know, like the, the, this all sort of synthetic biology field that is being decided in very, very small groups like of powerful interests, right? And without like getting like people involved without making sure people understand what are the consequences of it. And then like those could really change dramatically um, like species and ecosystems and so on, right? So that's all the issues that with technology and like it's, another leverage factor so it's a leverage if it's done in a sustainable and just way but it is going to be a driver of biodiversity loss like and climate change if it's done and as a business as usual way right and then there is the whole idea of reusing reducing the whole idea of reducing i think first uh, our like consumption in general right we should not like we didn't we don't need that many things probably to leave and we should be thinking about that and i think a lot um, of groups within society is thinking about that already but that's a very strong leverage point as well and this is my favorite to be honest if i have a favorite that i would like to share which is something that like it's very kind of like whoa it looks weird like unleashing values and actions what, what the heck is that so like so they found out through the studies like that individuals don't lack the motivation for action so it means basically that me you all of us here like we don't want to be bad people basically it's not that we don't want to be bad people we don't like the fact of that our actions 
are gonna hurt other people, right? We don't wanna live like that. So, but our current systems, our current infrastructure, the, 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 the social infrastructure, so meaning policies, norms, right? Like habits, like behavior, like legislation, um, power struggles, they don't allow us to be the good people that we really want to be. They don't allow us to live our lives without oppressing other people, right? So it means that if we are able to change some of these social infrastructures, that's what they call, right? Or some of these habits and norms, it means that we're, we're gonna be unleashing the true values and the true actions of all the people collectively, right? So for instance, like I know that in developed countries, like in richer countries, you have much more of this kind of like programs, policies and investments that can help us take the best decision, right? So you can buy local food, you can buy organic food, you can like um, buy things that are fair trade and all those kind of things. So you can start to live more up to the way you want it to live because of those policies, right? Um, in many other countries that is completely unheard of, right? So it means also that we should not be responsibilizing the individual. Okay, so this is really, really hugely important because we tend to point fingers at people and we tend to sort of like blame individuals for not being able to like consume sustainably or buy local food or buy organic or buy fair trade or like use the bicycle or all this kind of things. When in the reality, the responsibility don't lie within the individuals. They should lie within the, the layers of decision makers that have more power over that, right? The individuals themselves, they don't have any power over these decisions unless it's a collective. So unless it's like elections, unless it's like this kind of more democratic and collective sort of like decision-making processes, right? So. And this is really important, why? Because there is like a sort of like um, commercial interest, especially political interest that we blame ourselves instead of blaming the real people that, I mean, the real responsible. So um, I don't know exactly the numbers anymore, but I know that it's about 10 to 20 companies they are responsible for like 80% of all the carbon emissions of the world, you know? So like, is it really like the thing to blame the individual like for using their car, you know, like, or is it to blame Shell, right? So like, this is sometimes like the narrative that these companies or this powerful interest will use, you know, like to, to do the, the things that they always did, right? Like the divide and conquer, right? Divide the people, make them mistrust each other, make them blame each other, and then they are gonna be distracted with that and not unite, you know, mobilize themselves to fight Shell, to fight Monsanto, to fight, you know, like, so somehow this is how a lot of like the, the, the power and the values and the actions of the people and the activists are being sort of diluted and not having the impact that it should have, right? So I think this is really, really important. Like we, yes, we have power, but like not at the same level as Shell, right? So we need to like, kind of like responsibilize the, the right like actors in the system. And in this way, we're gonna be able to unleash the best of us, right? Um, now we are getting to the end of my presentation or this kind of like collective reflect with all of you guys. But I think like, if you could think of your lifestyle, of your career, of your actions, like how can you reflect some of these leverage points in your actions in your life? So for instance, if you are a researcher, like with, with all this kind of like tools, right? This box of leverage points, how do you think you can change and like sort of like challenge yourself, right? To transform your practices so that they can reflect those points 
a little bit more. Do you think like that the research you're doing, is it rights based? Um, so if you do a field research in a developing country with a local community, like do you like engage this community at the same level? You know, like do you share the results of your research or like the knowledge that your group have with the community, right? Um, so like if you're a teacher, like how are you doing your lessons? Like are you being able to sort of like really promote like this sort of critical thinking? Like, I know it's not easy, you know, like, and I'm not saying that to point fingers or to blame anybody because exactly because of that last, last, last is light, right? Sometimes we are, we have our hands so tight, so tight that it's kind of like really, 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 really difficult to do anything. And we are living like that with like absence of resources, with absence of like incentives and all this kind of things. So this is really like a reflection point, right? Like, because if we are able, these are opportunities. So if we are able to reflect some of those points in whatever it is that we are doing, we will all be moving towards this direction, towards this pathway for change, pathway for sustainability and for a just transition, right? So then it doesn't matter if we are being coordinated or not. If all of us moving that direction, this is the collective power that can really challenge the establishment and like make the things change, okay? So this is just like, I'm, I'm sorry if my talk was a bit too broad or like um, too... I don't know, like, um, but it was kind of like my attempt to have somehow like a discussion and a reflection with all of you guys. Now I'm just gonna briefly talk about my organization, which is the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which is functioning, functioning at the moment as the International Coordination Youth Platform for youth participation, like in, in, in the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, and like it's also kind of like now becoming this global movement of young people that are interested in biodiversity and they're working actively towards that um, and that together in a collective movement is trying to apply those leverage points and see how much change we can contribute to right so we have like chapters so these are all the chapters that we have we represent about like 1.2 million at the moment and it's kind of like this bottom up collective process. So like you really do like the teams are all mostly volunteers and they do what they wish to do, but we are able to create this like-minded community that can support each other, right? And that can keep ourselves sort of strong to keep pushing for those values and principles that we believe lead to a better collective vision for good life to everybody. And then we do these youth-led actions towards in many different ways, but mostly on capacity building and empowerment, advocacy and campaigning and ground mobilization actions. And then like all this community since 2017 has been working together and has been discussing together, like a lot of like um, perspectives. So what are young people's perspectives towards their future, what they want for their future, what kind of like good life they envision and what is the characteristics of this vision, right? So we conduct the consultations and like workshops so that we could have those discussions. And then like the community came out with a position paper. Oh, I'm so sorry. Like that you can access here, like in this link. Um, and this position paper contains this vision of this community and, and these young people and their priorities and is being pushed through our advocacy and campaigning like activities at the biodiversity negotiations under the UN. So like between like, I mean, it was supposed to be in 2020, right? But it never happened because of COVID and so on. But we are still in this kind of like battle to have like a new like global framework for biodiversity conservation that all the countries in the world 
should sign, right, and should start like implementing. And given the Global Youth Biodiversity Network is being able to kind of like through effective youth participation, influence a little bit this process to see, you know, to have a voice in this process so that like we can try to promote changing in this way as well. Okay, so the negotiation is, is ongoing. And to be honest, it's not very looking very promising at the moment because there is a lot of like resistance um, towards like rights <laughs> in, in, and like towards real change. Um, we are observing a lot more like um, influence and pressure from corporate interests like regarding biodiversity and climate. So you see a lot of cooptation and so on and so on. So things are not looking very promising. And I think that's why a lot more of this reflection among civil society, among activists needs to happen because it's not necessary that we need to align ourselves and move to sort of like coordinate it like an army, like, you know, together like an army. It's not about that, but it's about like, um, compact set sharing and aligning our visions you know and our sort of like strategies in a way so that we are not necessarily together but we are aligned pushing in the same direction and i think this is what is probably going to make a dent in this in this kind of like very negative trend that we are seeing like this kind of very green trend that we are seeing in the world in general and this is just kind of like the outcomes of like all this consultative, collective consultative process within our community. So this is the vision for the future with biodiversity, like a, a living in harmony with nature for young people. So it is to keep the integrity of our life support system um, through a society living sustainably and through equity for nature and people together, right? So it's really like the reconciliation with like us within nature like that young people are like wanting for, like dreaming of, right? And these are some of the priorities that we think like through this, we will be able to achieve like this vision and it's through intergenerational equity principles and full and effective participation of youth, especially, but also of like all the rights holders in general, which are, is like indigenous people and local communities and women, like the, the people that are most affected and they're most at the frontiers of biodiversity loss. It's also through education and the real change of values, right? The transition of values that cannot happen without education and, and, and without this kind of rethinking our values and without ensuring the rights of all these rights holders and for people and nature as well. Um, yeah, so like this is a little bit the end. So this, if you guys want more resources to understand a little bit more like biodiversity what is happening but also the negotiations of the global policy and the governance behind like we have this publication it's called cbd in a nutshell and it's really easy to read and then like you can understand a lot more of this process and it's in our web page that is here um, we also have like a brief on transformative education, what we are understanding as a community about transformative education and how we can leverage really like use this leverage point um, is all available in our web page. And this is like for you guys, if you have any more like information that you want about the community or if you want to get involved, like there is more information like in this links and like at the moment, we are mostly like active on Telegram communities, like because uh, I don't know what is your age group, but like younger people, they tend to like not use email so much, but like they they are very active in these different channels for communication. I'm so sorry. I think I went above my time um, of speaking and but it's been a pleasure to be here with you guys. I really saw some of like the comments and like the discussions and reflections from you about the complexity. And I'm really, really um, pleased that you guys are enjoying and that you feel instigated by all of this. And if there is any time left, I also can take some questions or comments as well. Like, but Sophie, that's with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Melina. Thank you so much for sharing those stories and interconnections with us. 
um, and I I was hooked on every minute, so I don't think you went overtime at all. Don't worry. Um, yeah, and we've got um, 15 minutes until 7 p.m. over here. Melina's in Los Angeles, so different timing. But um, yeah, we've got a couple extra minutes. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention again to folks who are still with us um, that that this talk is recorded and we'll share that as well as all the links that Melina shared in the follow-up email. So you'll have that at the tip of your finger. Um, in case you're interested in checking out those publications, I'm really curious about that one that was sort of amalgamated from the, from the results of many chapters. Um, and something that I found really heartening was just the, drawing all those interconnections, something at Northeast Wilderness Trust that we say often is, you know, everybody can get involved in rewilding in some way. And, you know, when I think about reintroducing predators or saving large-scale landscapes that can seem really far away for a lot of us who are teachers or activists or work more than 40 hours a week and seeing all those interconnections of how transformative education how justice initiatives healthcare etc is all connected to biodiversity and how our individual choices even when they can feel really small um are all connected I, th I think that really gets to the core of how we can all be involved in rewilding. You know, some people are going to be more directly involved in, in direct conservation, but it's all interrelated. And I wanted, did you, um, I wanted to read out loud this comment from Kurt, which I think gets at that when we see how Gibbon, Global Youth Biodiversity Network, is this network of so many people across so many countries. Um, Kurt said, complex systems are non-linear in nature, meaning that sometimes large change comes from small changes. All the little acts we take could spur something significant. Um, so I have a quick question for you about um, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network chapters. Are there any in Northeast America New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut area. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Sophie. So yes, I I, I heard from my colleague that um, she lives in New York and she's working together with a group of young people. They're trying to create a chapter. So the thing is that since we are a network, like we do things more bottom up and also because there is no institutional support. I mean, that's the life of like youth activists everywhere. Like you're yeah. going to see that it's the same with like Fridays for Future and like Black Lives Matter and all of that, like um, which is complicated, but it also keeps everything pretty much ground like like. Right. So the idea is that if you're interested, you can start working together with your group. And then like, if it's like a sub-regional or something like in your community, like you can try to do that, like, and then you can contact the steering committee of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and have a chat with them and see how they can sort of transfer, like, um, and reflect some of the values of the community, especially if they are like-minded and how they can start to join and engage with the activities. Everything is very sort of like fluid, Right. So if you're interested and if you're active, you, you can just do it. Right. There is no pressure to do it all the time It's basically through motivation. Um, and then like we do offer a lot of like courses, like we have workshops all the time in events all the time, like mostly online at the moment. Um, but there were like a lot of opportunities for joining like regional workshops in person in like to be part of delegations to these um, conferences as well. I can put down the email of my like colleague that is living in New York and then like anybody that is interested can also contact her directly or like can just join through the community on Telegram and then people will also be able to help you guys out. Like, just That's wonderful. The email. So it sounds like there's a budding one in New York, but in the rest of New England, like Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, Yes, I just Connecticut there there isn't any yet so there might be opportunities for exactly. people to start those. Exactly. Great. Um and then I saw just one other question in the chat that I will share. Um so one of the 
basic tenets that you speak about is the connection to nature and recognizing all the needs that nature offers us, all these benefits. And Annette had a great question about um, your thoughts about in modern day society when so many people are mobile, either for reasons of privilege and being able to move around the world or move for work all the time, um, or uh, reasons of refugee status, whether that's because of violent displacement or climate change, um, environmental crises. So there's so much movement around, people might either not have a relationship to place in nature in the first place, or they might have been forcibly had to leave the home place that they have a connection to. What are your thoughts about um, how that might affect our connection to nature and um, healing that root of where some of this environmental activist motivation comes from? Yeah, no, wow, that's a very deep, like a <laughs> very interesting question. Um, I can share some insights of my personal sort of trajectory so far because yeah. I, I really, I am born, I was born and raised in a huge city with like 25 million people in the metropolitan area. And like, so like what kind of community, right? Is that like, do we have a sense of community if you're in an urban like environment where people are mostly disconnected and alienated? Like, um, so, so how do we reconcile, right? When there is not a place anymore. And I think, I'm still sort of like seeking those answers and, and, and those kind of like understandings. But um, I am seeing nowadays that like the, the good and I mean the good and the, I know it, it sounds very simplistic and superficial, but like um, traveling around and like meeting different people from different cultures, like, you can connect yourself to that as well, you know, like because you see all these different like people working on the ground, working like in different environments and so on, but they are like minded in the same that they share your vision of like future, they share like your vision of good life, and they are doing that in their own communities, in their own sense. So there you can also kind of start to reconcile with that vision of good nature and good future and like of a community. So that is also a community in a sense, you know, like it's, it's not a community that is connected to a certain territory, like, like so many people, you know, but it, it, it is a sense of community as well, right? And for instance, this is a very interesting thing that we have been hearing a lot from other Gibbon members, like, like the members of the network, that they also feel that they are part of this community, which is this like group of young people that are pushing in the same direction. And it's really interesting how you have these workshops and then you have people from different countries, from different like levels of privilege, different backgrounds, but can talk the same language, not the language, but the same like energy and the same sort of motivation. And this puts a lot of strength in these people. I mean, this gives a lot of energy. This gives a sense of belonging also because I feel that a lot of the consumerism, a, a lot of like the mental health issues that we are having in this world that is connected to the oppression that we are living through, right? Like it is coming from the sense of not belonging, the sense of wanting to belong somewhere and that for many people, that means like buying things or becoming things, right? Like, but it could be also this lost sense of community that we might have to sort of like transform as well, right? So if before it was like, oh, I come from this community, this time community here in the US or in Brazil, and that's my identity and that's my culture and that's where I come from. Now the world's globalized, people are living in cities, people are moving so much, right? So where is your sense of community? So it could be lying with your family, with your like-minded people, you know, like it doesn't necessarily be with a location. But like, I think these are kind of like 
open-ended questions that like you should definitely find people to talk about it and I invite all of you guys to join Gavin because like we do have quite a lot of this kind of like conversations going on absolutely continuing the conversation and and I mean yeah but I I really got that from your whole presentation of all of this is just is is fodder for continuing the conversation and continuing the march towards a good life and good nature and a more whole and healthy world. Well, thank you so much, Melina. I really appreciate your time and your energy and sharing with us um, not only the story of biodiversity, but also the great work you're doing with Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Um, we will be wishing you the best and thank you to everybody who joined us for tuning in. It was lovely to have you. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll share that follow up email within about a week. Thank you so much. Thank Take you care. so much, everyone. Like, yeah, let's keep in touch. <laughs>